Hi everyone, it is Hanan from I Deserve Couture and today we're going to be talking about a very specific subject. Sorry for my hair, I just showered so I'm like, you know what, let me look presentable for them. You can see the subject from the title. I haven't done a video in such a long time because I've been in Croatia for a vacation visiting my friends and family. So I am back to bother you with some fashion content. So before I continue this video, make sure you subscribe to the channel. I'm not talking this just because I like saying it. Girl, subscribe. I've seen the statistics. They're here. A lot of you that watch do not subscribe. That is homophobic. Am I offended? No. But does it hurt? Yes. But just make sure you subscribe to the channel, it helps me, it helps you, and it's proven that people that subscribe to this channel are considered more fashionable. You get the gist, just subscribe. So on to the video. As you know from my name, Couture is everything that I love about fashion. So I'm always trying to find these fashion stories as much as I can. And whenever they're about Couture, I jump on it and don't let it go. And I feel that this story has to be told because I don't know anybody talking about it. And I'll tell you how I came to see it. I was reading this book called The Fashion Conspiracy and it's talking about the importance of the clients from Middle East and how unfairly they were treated by Couture houses. I tried to find more sources about this, but really there isn't a lot. I did find a couple of news articles that I'm going to try to incorporate in this, but all the information that I'm getting is from this book. So let's talk about it. The period that we're talking about is the late 80s. It is actually sad to see how much the Middle East brought to couture world and was not even being acknowledged. Even unacknowledged, Middle East had a, such a strong buying power. Here are nine cities in that area that had a tremendous buying power. And considering these cities, you would think that this is actually a legit crazy rich market that fashion can capitalize on and they did according to the book out of all of these kuwait was the most important one followed by dubai and then riyadh but back in the 80s couture houses would not even acknowledge where their clothes would go they would always focus on clients in new york london paris milan and tokyo but intentionally ignoring the fact that there was a lot of their clothes going to the gulf the houses were selling and making a lot of money off of the clients in the Gulf. But according to the fashion conspiracy book, no Arab customer is ever mentioned in rather important house lists of famous couture clients. So they would mention the starlets, celebrities, the wife of Italian industrialists, first wives, but they would never mention the wife of the oil tycoon from Bahrain. You would think that the oil tycoons from America would carry the same prestige as the one from Bahrain, and we'll get to that later. Now, as far as the acknowledgement goes, I have to be fair and play a case. The couture world is very secretive and very private. So a lot of them do not want to be in the public eye. They do not want to be exposed and that's fine. But did the customers from the Gulf expect privacy? Some of them probably yes. But this is the answer that a Parisian couturiers would give you. One American client said that clearly it is a classic blend of French snobbishness and xenophobia. All I can say is whenever I go to my couturier's showroom, it is crawling with Saudi princesses looking very chic, with their bodyguards waiting outside on the sidewalk. There are actually few couture houses that are talking about their Arab customers and basically praise them. Valentino in Rome would name his Arabian customers by name, but the one that caught me off guard, to be honest, was the one that spoke the most about this, and that is Eric Mortison from Balmain. So if you did not know, Pierre Balmain died in 1982, and Eric, who became his first assistant in 1951, took over Balmain after Pierre's death. And he was actually talking about the clients and the prices in the same paragraph in this book. We took an order of wedding dress yesterday, 450,000 francs, he said, but we have made more expensive ones, up to 600,000, plus the bridesmaids. They can be 10, 11, 12 years old, and the dresses are each 125,000 150 or 175,000 francs, all depending on the embroidery and if they're trimmed with white mink. That's why I ask, why in France do we put down these Arab petrodollars? We should be happy to have these petrodollars, because if we didn't have these clients, all the big houses would have to cut down our seamstresses and our workroom to a quarter. I hate the word petrodollar. What does it even matter? As long as the money is not stolen, the money is good, which is 100% a fair point. So the question is, how much did they spend? Look at the pose of these hands. I'm I mean, well, let's read what Andrew Leontali has to say about that. I've been at Valentino when they have packed off almost a whole boutique for a wedding, 150 pairs of shoes just buying and buying the way that you would buy seeds for garden. They took me to a room and it was hung all the way around with clothes going to Kuwait. Many of the houses were aware of the buying power that the people from the Gulf had, and they were very about milking whatever they can from them. They would play into their taste for expensive beading, 
literally the dresses were beaded from the top to bottom and they would beat everything gloves hats stockings everything was beaded and according to Pierre Cardin they would pay all this money and still be ripped off there is no doubt that during the mad days of the first oil boom there was hardly an atelier that didn't add a 20,000 franc supplement to these clients and he finishes his quote by saying but not by us very smart Pierre the man comes with a disclaimer brilliant another person that loves talking about this is Bruce Oldfield and he's a British couturier who reckons that 30% of his clients are women from the Middle East. He said that clients would come to him from Paris where no one would mention them. And he said that although they're high in the buying stakes, they're deemed low in prestige. Referring to the couture world and how they saw people from the Gulf. He continues and says, I have fantastic Arab clients. Arab women are far more savvy about the way that they want to look than the English. And it's not that designers did not design with Middle East in their mind. They definitely did. One assistant from Bond Retailer basically breaks down the collection and explains that a lot of the collections by the big European fashion designers could be divided into parts. So one part you're going to have like outrageous outfits that are going to end up in magazines tomorrow. Next part is a like commercial core of the collection. And then there was what he calls gaudy part, which was between cocktail and evening dresses, where you could see bright stuff, heavily beaded stuff, which maybe would not go with the rest of the collection, but eventually you would forget about it because you would focus on the stuff that you actually liked. And then you would realize that the gaudy and the beaded stuff were not meant for you. And you're not the target market, but it is the people from the Middle East. So why did Arab women love couture so much? Two words, luxury and quality. If you ever read this book, there is one sales associate that talks about the way that their bodies are and basically her whole fact is that American women when they grow older they tend to be more slimmer while Arab women tend to be more rounder and she's like that is just their body type and when I read that I'm like what but luxury and quality have this special place in Arab women's life when it comes to couture so for example when it comes to the weddings Arab women want the wow effect and according to Bruce, they understand the value of one-off gown. Basically, they're going to pay extra money or as much as they can to make sure that no one else has a dress like them. And this is why I like them. This is my type of people. And quality, let's just put it like this. Arab women have looked around and seen the best. Maybe they haven't seen everything in the terms of design, but in terms of quality, they have. And they have the funds to say, hey, that is the best quality. I do want that. Please do remember that during this whole video, everything that I'm talking about is how it was in the 80s. So we talked about what women like when it comes to couture, but what did make Arab women such desirable? clients. Actually two things. First, loyalty. They're extremely loyal customers. If the client is very happy with your work, she's going to come back to you till the end of time. And this loyalty is the reason why it was very difficult for young emerging designers to break into this market because Arab women would not leave their couturiers very easily. The second thing is the size of the family. Now, do not turn off this video because I know that sounds crazy. Like You're like, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Trust me, it makes sense. Now, the average size of a family in Oman is eight people. Saudi Arabia, five to six. Kuwait is five people. Again, these numbers are today. I think that that number was bigger back in the 80s and 90s. Today, an Emirates average family has five people. And in Qatar, which has one of the highest per capita incomes in the world, an average family counts eight people. Now hold that and listen to this. According to Reuters in 2011, their social calendar consists of 15 to 20 weddings per year and private parties every month. Now, do you realize how many couture dresses that is? Also, one more thing. These weddings are not just like a one day thing. Sometimes wedding lasts three or even more days. So the clients will need more than one dress. But you have weddings, you have charity balls, you have high society parties. Basically, that is a lot of couture. Bruce Oldfield said also, once you have an Arab client, they're yours for life and will bring in their daughter, their granddaughter, and remember they have large families. For a wedding, the whole family gets involved. So you have the bride, her sister, perhaps her aunt and friends, all wearing dresses worth 20,000 pounds. Many of my Arab clients will also order two or more of the same dresses to keep in their various palaces. So there are also events where women know that men will not be present. So people from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, and other parts of the Gulf are going to go ahead and spend $50,000 on a low cleavage LeMay dress. With all that being said, and loyalty being a huge factor, I do have to say that there are a couple of 
designers that are newer, that are now being supported by this market. When you think about designers like Ellie Saab or Zuhair Murad, they are the Lebanese designers that are showing in Paris that do have this market also. But there's one thing I will always remember when it comes to reading this chapter. They have this term that was used by couture houses when they would get a lot of orders from the Gulf. And it stuck with me because I felt uncomfortable reading that. It hits different. The term was knocking on desert's door. And it was a euphemism for getting orders from the Gulf. I do not know the reference to this term, but if the term came about in the 90s, it could be the Guns and Roses knocking on heaven's door. But do not quote me on that. That is just my guess. There are differences between Arab couture women and a Western couture woman. Back in the 80s, Arab women tend to wear one designer head to toe. They wouldn't mix designers. So if it was Valentino dress, it was Valentino shoes, it was Valentino bag, it was Valentino gloves. The second difference was the way that they were seeing the couture process. Andrew Leontali said that, they buy the way that it's shown. The woman of culture doesn't buy couture the way it's shown. She changes the color, changes the shoe. But these Arab women at Valentino point out what they like and have it sent. Also, there's one huge factor that I have to talk about, and that is the intent of the clothes. Arab women, and according to the book, especially Saudi women, they dress to impress each other. And we do have to remember that they do have the restrictions, because according to the book, it would be considered very raunchy to wear a, a backless Nina Ritchie dress. They also get together in their couture, not for breakfast necessarily, but for what they call a video tease. Now, in order to talk about these video tees, we have to talk about one thing that definitely helped and changed fashion but people do not realize how big it was. And believe it or not, it's VHS. So back in the 60s, for example, Ungaro would have to show his collection three times a week live. So with models, with makeup, with audience. Imagine today having Dior show their collection three times a week in Paris. But back in the day, Dior and Patu, for example, they went further and they would show every day. It was very expensive, but it was a way for people to see these clothes. So when the video came about, they decided to film the show and then they would send these tapes to all the customers around the world. Haute Couture sold by video actually accounted for 35% of the sales of Couture back in 1986. So let's go back to the Middle East and the Gulf. These video tees are events that would happen from noon till 4 p.m. And several dozen wives would get together in the women's quarters and they would watch fashion shows on the video. And then they would have instructions on how to order the dress. One couturier's assistant described the call. Sometimes we take orders from six or more women at the same time. They come on a telephone one after another from the same house, giggling and laughing like schoolgirls and having such fun. So now when you compare all of this to 2023, the situation is a lot different, I believe. The Middle East market is huge now. And we live in a completely different world where I believe that a woman from Qatar or women from America, they do have the same prestige. I do not think that there is brands that are kind of like shying away from any market at this point. And honestly, I can think of a lot of a couture house that are big, that are catering to that market now. And as they should. I just find it so sad that they would look down on a market like this that had the money and had the resources and was a constant customer. But there was one thing that Bruce said that I kind of find funny. He did say that there was one negative about the Arab couture customers and he never took it too seriously. It was just a part of their culture, he says. He goes, he's like, they would love to bargain. But I do think that this is a very interesting story, especially now when the market of Middle East is becoming one of the most dominant ones. So I hope that you like this video. I did find it very interesting, honestly, and I did wanted to share it with you because I haven't seen a lot of people talking about this. Again, all of this is taken from the book called The Fashion Conspiracy. So before you leave, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Meanwhile, their hair was not giving me tough time. Okay, cool. I hope you're having an amazing day. We're going to be doing a lot of vlogging. I'm going to do the whole fashion month. So I'm planning, keyword planning. So I'm planning to have one vlog from each city. Very ambitious, I know, very ambitious. But I hope you're having an amazing day. Goodbye. Bye.